Hey, what's up, everybody? We have returned for another Half Dead Musings podcast. I forget which number. What is it? Six, I think. 69, I think. <laughs> it reminds me of a comedy joke I wrote. Uh, anyways, you know who I am. I, I run the Dead Man Dreams channel. I'm Brian, of course, and here with Marco. Your From the Musings by, Mark Ch- Musings by Marco channel. How's it going? Good, good. How, how's everything going by you? Everybody's good. Uh, yeah, not bad. Nice. I uh, got uh, dragged out of the house for some fresh air today for a change. That was, that was <laughs> different. So, yeah, me too. I've been just real busy. I've been writing the comedy script. I was trying to get it done for this contest, but unfortunately the uh, software messed up and it, I was trying my best to get it in, but I couldn't get it in. But I'm not really trying oh, to be a screen. Sucks. Yeah, I wasn't able to get it, but I'm not trying to be a screenwriter anyway. And that was more of a screenwriter's contest. And they were going to hook you up with writing opportunities. And nah, I, I'm trying to do the acting and producing. And, you know, I, that's where I went to school for. And that's where my main talents are. So might as well stick well, to sure it. I'm sure something else will come up in the future. And then uh, you can yeah. finish it on your own time now and have it ready to go. Yeah, I want to get the recording with everybody. I'm going to start networking with people in, uh, yeah, probably in a matter of months now. I'm just going to try to start recruiting and uh, look into the... Hey, if you, you know, want a uh, voiceover for animation, I've always been interested in that. Yeah, you know, uh, there's going to be a part of it where I'm going to do some voiceovers from like a acting like everybody's watching a TV screen all bored at one point. And I'm um, you know, I don't want to say too much, but I'm just going to do a lot of voiceovers of like standard, typical newscasters being boring and everybody will look all bored. <laughs> but uh, all right. For Sounds his- boring. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. After like all this chaos that's happening in the show, there's going to be this finally a lull moment and that sets up another funny joke. But anyways, uh, as far as this podcast goes, uh, we've got a bunch of topics to cover. Uh, we always come with- up with something. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> so let's start off with uh, free will. I was starting to w- watch and really delve into the Sam Harris. You stuff. have no free will. <laughs> and that's what Sam Harris says. Uh, and he's been saying this. I think the, there's a video on YouTube of him in front of a live audience from like 2012 or 2013 or something like that. And it was called Dangerous Minds. And he was in front of a live audience and just talking about this. And he was actually really funny audience yeah. guess what you are all slaves <laughs> and, and you don't even know it and you like it so <laughs> what he says though is like you know what out of a guy from a guy who's like very scientific minded who, who really kind of sees everything is sort of dead in a way he got a spiritual side to him uh, to him all of a sudden over the years where when you start meditating, you get into this state of mind where you're just watching the random things that pop up in your mind and you're All realizing that oxygen you get when you're meditating can make you a little high. Well, there's different kinds of meditation. You don't have to be doing like deep breathing. A lot of them, you just monitor your regular breath and you're in a relaxed state of mind and you're just trying to keep a clear mind. And you realize that no matter what, when you try to keep a clear mind, you're actually not able to. And there's, there's this spontaneous thoughts that are going to arise. And Sam Harris points out, where are these spontaneous thoughts coming from? Like, like say one of his good examples was like right now, I'll just tell you, uh, think of a, a movie that, you know, choose any movie. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, just say it, say which one you don't have to keep a secret. Uh, when Harry met Sally, <laughs> and see, which I think is like an old porn video. <laughs> I, I've heard of, I've heard of, I don't even know if it's porn or whatever. It sounds familiar, whatever it is. But I'm anyway, not even sure what it is. But I think that's what <laughs> I think it it's is. a regular like movie from like the 40s or something. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but I think right. it's also a lot of pornos are called. It was probably that came first, and of course they always make a porno about it. Yeah. <laughs> what was the lord of the rings there was a lord of the rings one call like with some f- hilarious name they changed lord of the rings to oh lord of the g strings i think oh, yeah, <laughs> there you go. lord of the cock ring <laughs> oh mm-hmm. man this is starting great tonight already <laughs> uh, but uh um, as usual what i was gonna say though is sam harris points out what you didn't know you were gonna have that thought like and you of course you can't think of all the movies you've never even heard of uh that's already eliminated so you can't be bringing up stuff that's out there but you don't know 
And so where did that thought come from? You didn't even know you were going to be thinking about movies 10 seconds before. It was my question that prompted it. And out of all the thousands of movies you know and are familiar with, why is it that only that one came up? Was it your will to only have that one come up? Or was that something that happened to you almost spontaneously? And when you really pay attention to it, that's what he says it is. I have a theory. Yeah, go for it. Here's a theory that just pops into my head as well. Uh, I uh, think of it like a, uh, a branching um, tree. Like um, you get an input of stimulus, which was the question, and then it uh, has a certain, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Memory? Memory, maybe? Uh, no, um, I'm a little tired today. Uh, it's like mm. uh, not a uh, association, uh, associations, uh, words have different associations, so movies will search out it will spark something in my brain and it'll kind of go down this pathway until it gets to maybe the first thing it hits and the strongest thing it hits it will kind of pick that up and then that will get bounced over to a different part of my brain where i express it so mm -hmm. it's like a signal came in got processed by my brain figure out what you're asking, what you want, what we're talking about. And then that kind of goes out from the, that point where it's understood. And this kind of seeks out, maybe it's randomly in all directions. Maybe it's to, <laughs> towards a certain part of the brain that has to do with memory. And then once it gets there, it just kind of like quests out almost randomly. And then maybe mm. it finds something like I've, uh, maybe I've talked about a movie recently or yeah. as someone that one was an seen extra, a movie recently. That was an extra random one that you pu pulled yeah, out. Yeah, that, at that, like I had an impulse for some like Jim Carrey almost came up, but then I couldn't think of like a certain name. So it's like my short term, like memory, mm. like I was, nothing was coming up. So it's like gave more time and it's like, uh, I think a longer term memory was allowed to surface because <laughs> yeah. I was, didn't pull anything from like recent memory from yeah, like I agree. several days ago. There's, there is so something about memory where the more maybe I'm getting memory. older. That's another problem. <laughs> when you get older, you always remember things easier from when way back. It, I agree though. The more recent things that you've experienced are more likely to resurface like the more recent movies you've watched, unless it's one of your all time iconic favorite movies, that one could pop up. But it, like, if you really pay attention to your thoughts he, in that example or examples, when you just lay down and try not to have any thoughts at all, you don't have any idea what you're going to think in a few minutes from now, uh, or even in five seconds from now, what might spontaneously come up. So, you know, like if you follow it back, like how you did, maybe it's possible that everything is, that well, all we have is the illusion of free will going back to the Big Bang and even before that. Because if you look at the Big Bang, it just launches out a bunch of protons and neutrons, electrons, neutrinos, all that kind of stuff. And then it start, the universe starts to cool. And then what is it? It forms gases and they start to get more dense and it forms a planet. And it's like we're all on this big, long thing of whatever you want to call it, the universe, the yeah, I don't even know what to call it, like the process. Uh, some people, I think, it, what is it called? Pan, uh, not panspermia, the... Uh, Sorry, pan I missed some of that because I got a pop-up that said, mm -hmm. I only have 10 minutes left in the Zoom meeting. Upgrade to Pro if you want to remove the one-hour time limit. Is so that really 10 what minutes, it Yeah, so in 10 minutes, we're going to have to cut this, and then uh, we'll just... Oh, I just uh, saw that, too. You'll oh, be able excellent. to do it pretty smoothly, but I'm sorry. I missed uh, some of where you're going with that. But you went way back yeah. on that answer. Yeah, I'm Jesus. saying, like, when you go... Yeah, <laughs> you went to... back to the beginning. Of the because, universe. yeah, like, if it, we're all yeah. from time started, as far as this universe goes, from that moment. And so when you go forward from that moment, it's like, <clears> seriously, <throat> it's like... Uh, everything has already been projected in a certain direction and what's to say our mind or the way i'm thinking right now or every person you've ever met every detail in your life where you live who your parents are who's to say that hasn't been already predetermined and <laughs> that that water's what swishing in his mouth is uh, predetermined as well maybe mm, it's just a brew. fascinating thought yeah, this know? is coffee Oh, I got you. No, I there love you go. cold some, brew coffee. Some energy. <laughs> um, got any more thoughts on that? 
I mean, predetermination, yeah. Uh, I just don't know if there's any, um, uh, doesn't spark anything of me. Like, uh, you don't know what thoughts uh, that are going to, it's, I'm, I don't think the predetermination is about you knowing, really, because you don't know. Mm -hmm. But in a way, the whole point is that you are kind of a passenger, your consciousness, the thing you think of yourself, the part that realizes things and knows things is kind of just uh, fed things that are just under the surface happening because of your chemistry, your biology and the physics of the known universe. And uh, these types of things are if maybe we had the processing power, the ability to uh analyze this these things sufficiently maybe we could uh predict what people are gonna do Mm -hmm. and but we don't that's a possibility maybe in the future we'll get better at you know maybe you can know what someone's gonna think i mean if you were able to uh like hook someone up to machines and then know a split second before they did what thought they were going to have. That's it's fact. That Sam would Harris be a strong support to uh, that idea. Thanks that, for bringing uh, that up. Cause Sam okay. Harris brings that up. That there are some examples of that, aren't there? Yeah. There's studies where they have people going, Oh, there's been a wide variety of them. It's proven where yeah. the computer is able to determine what the person's decision is going to be uh, sometimes up to like a few minutes, but oftentimes about five seconds and like it could be oh, something yeah. as simple as which arm are you going to raise your left or your yeah. right arm or and... there's uh i've heard of people are in a room and they ask them to make a decision on something in a test environment and uh, uh basically they make a decision right away but they might take a long time before they actually follow through on it yeah, yeah. i don't remember exactly like what they were measuring or how you know uh, oh th- but... there's another one about how time works they had this uh it's not I don't know if it's a part of the free will thing or not, but uh, they have like a bunch of flashing images happening on a screen in front of a person. And they were monitoring like the stress rates of the person. <laughs> and uh, what they I love, found was- I love mild torture, torturing <laughs> people to the legal limit. It's great. <laughs> no, it's almost like a That would be a job I would like. <laughs> yeah, but, clockwork. Yeah. <laughs> ah, stop. Opening his eyes with the gout, <laughs> forcing him watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, wait let no, me get to this part though it's not important. the seventh not the seventh so Beethoven they had these flashing symphony. the images in front of the, the people and what they found was they would have this stress reaction even before they saw the image uh whenever they would have something sexual or violent coming up anything that would arouse or cause stress so and these people were reacting like literally fractions of a second before a few seconds maybe i forget the exact time frame on that but it's like the universe or something in them knew they were about to be exposed to this yeah. violent imagery or the sexual imagery and that is mind-blowing stuff and that's well-established fact as well so maybe we were on uh evidence for the simulation <laughs> probably maybe it's just uh it's processing things that it, you know it's like uh, a little easier to to send it through the person first and then through the instrument second. Yeah. I was, uh, uh, did you see that interview with uh, Grimes? Uh, on, yeah, uh, I saw Lex a lot Friedman? of it. Not all of it, but yeah, I listened to a, a lot of that it. That was a fun one. I recommend viewers to uh, check that out because um, she uh, was thrust into uh, being a much bigger star than she ever would have been on her own because of her, you know, having being you know with elon musk and with her children with him and everything and you know she had her own music she had her own phone but she became way more famous because of that and because of that there was a lot of interest to paint her to make her look a certain way or to make her look crazy in uh in the public but um if you uh get into know her um she's uh she has some interesting thoughts and uh she's uh, like some of the stuff that we like with like uh you know, one of our favorite books is Dune. The science uh, fiction one was great. Video she was talking games about, that we know oh, about. about simulation. She was talking yeah. about how there was this computerized simulated hell that they would put people through in this science fiction world. That's which... in one of the culture books I told you about that uh, from Ian M. Banks. It's from that uh, yeah. series. And uh, so it was... you haven't looked the one up yet, have you? No, I've been busy as hell. <laughs> but Laura, yeah. listen. There, it's up to society and like Sam Harris was bringing this up as well uh, where he was talking about how 
we need to make sure that if we are going to create machines that are conscious and that can feel real suffering the same way a human being can feel real suffering it's up to us to make sure that they're not being like living a hell creation because that basically would be what it is like a simulated hell created by humanity and who knows maybe you know with all the suffering in this world maybe we're in like a, a simulated purgatory right now what is he saying it's up to us if that exists somewhere in the future what do you yeah mean? like as technology gets better and the ai gets really intelligent and smarter than humans we got to be careful on oh just not kind of making think about these things now so we don't create some terrible yeah future yeah yeah that uh, made me think of the uh brought up simulation and um grimes in that interview uh, which was you know cool overall and people should check it out but uh, one of the things was uh just talk about like the speed of light as the rendering rate of the simulation and uh maybe uh, if it gets upgraded uh, we'll be able to break the speed of light so uh if they upgrade their computers that are running us then Mm -hmm. maybe all of a sudden it'll be easier for us to discover a way to go faster than the speed of light and break on through uh, the other side (laughs) yeah and uh it's you know it's funny to think that like uh if that's the case like how much are we being limited or controlled uh by something like that true it's definitely a rabbit hole if you go down that whole simulation theory yeah you know also if you go by the theory that the universe starting here is just how our time is black holes may have white holes on the other end and uh White holes that spit out everything. Yeah, spitting out a new universe. Instead of just, sucking in everything. Yep, the same way that it, it spit out everything here to create our universe. So there's the multiverse theory now. And yeah, there's a bunch of theories out there. Uh, even dark matter, They, I like how Neil deGrasse Tyson says, you should just call it Fred because we have no idea what it is. It shouldn't be called matter yeah. at all. Yeah, it leads you into thinking it's one thing, but we really have the only thing we know about it is it's causing gravity. Yeah, it should just be called mysterious gravity. Yeah, I like that. And because we have uh, calculations for orbits and things and what they should be. And then we have uh, them thrown off by things that and uh, where the things are. Like if it was a mass of a planet or something where there should be something to throw them off by that amount, mm-hmm. there's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, yeah. So that's what we call dark matter. And we don't know what's causing this aberration to gravity. He said- and maybe it, it could be, I don't know if this is just me not knowing not enough about the field, but you know how in quantum mechanics, like things change. Uh, like classical physics kind of breaks down when you get to the very, very tiny. Oh, yeah. Maybe when you Double. get to the very, very large, there is a similar mm. effect of uh, the the gravity slightly breaking, not working the way that we think. Smart. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, you know, it works in, you know, our, you know, some pretty big things like, you know, our solar system, our galaxy, you know, but, but our uh, whole solar system's tiny. Our sun is minuscule compared yeah, to what's the out there. Things, yeah. So, yeah, got to keep that in mind. Neil deGrasse Tyson said that I believe from one star talk, he said uh, he thinks dark matter is most likely some kind of particle that we have not yet been able to discover. That's what he was thinking. But he, he also gave like a more fun, but less likely, uh, uh, idea but i can't remember what it is off the top of my head he said yeah that particle was most likely but hmm. you never seen the big bang theory oh yeah i've seen it yeah i've seen plenty over the years the tv show yeah, we're I'm, talking <laughs> i'm binging that i'm on season eight now i think uh, i never saw it the whole time it was airing and i kind of <laughs> got it recently so i've been uh, having fun going through it they had real and, the real uh, stephen hawking in an episode Oh, he's been in a lot of episodes. Oh, was it? He's cameoed in, in season eight. He's been in uh, maybe four or five episodes so far. Yeah, there's been others, um, too. Yeah. Uh, well, on the show, uh, he, he used to work on string theory. The main character is a physicist. Yeah, Sheldon. And he started on string theory, and then he never made any progress. So he switched to dark matter. <laughs> kind of would be interesting to look into that and see like what, what have been, if is there in any work in you know dark matter. Yeah. And it would be cool, but it's hard to uh, to access the, the research papers because like a lot of the research papers are locked behind these kind of paywalls where if you have maybe if you're part of a university, they, they pay for that. They're journals, but, uh, they call them, right? Journals and yeah, certain specific uh, journal yeah, scientific names. Scientific journals. Uh, yeah. But 
because it's not open source that stifles progress if everyone were it were free for everyone to look and examine it and uh, add to it mm -hmm. then it's it's only a good thing that more people could um you know potentially have a good insight that uh could lead to an advancement in the field yeah um, i agree do universities have to pay to get into it or something is that how they do wanna... currently yeah they pay hmm. and uh it's all kind of siloed and locked down uh that's a cool thing about uh the new uh digital economy that's like it seems like it's a holdover from like pre-computer times but now hmm. with the internet it's more things are open source and more things are freely shared there's a lot of advertising and whatnot going on but that that brings me to this other idea about education in general where um the uh, the future of education is where um it's it's free and accessible to everyone online in a high quality format like where, Khan academy that reminds me yeah, i see those videos all the time yeah like where you're able to have one person who's really great as a top expert on a subject matter and they're really passionate about it you know because certain teachers you know though when they're into it it gets you more into it mm -hmm. right but you know any given teacher is supposed to teach you a wide range of things that yeah. they might not be interested in oh most so of it, it not. <laughs> yeah so if you're able to get at every grade level if you're able to get one teacher for each subject matter bringing a new person who is like That's the awesome. best in the world at that and they're able to uh allow you to um at least see some lectures by that person and maybe in test. the future like create some artificial intelligence that is able to kind of like put in some of their responses and stuff um a way for you to interact with the best in any field mm -hmm. so that you get the best education possible whether you know from your own home computer and you don't have to go to harvard or the best school in the world you, the best school yeah. is any computer in the world is a combination of all the best schools put together <laughs> yeah true you know, that'd be cool how many more geniuses could we have yeah exactly you know what this reminds me of where we were going to talk about how uh elon musk was saying that he's scared of that the life extension technology might not be that good of a thing for the progress of humanity because all these older people are setting their ways setting their opinions and their beliefs and they have their ego invested into it uh for you know decades and so they're not going to change their mind even when the new evidence comes out and so especially like you know having term limits would help a lot too in politics and for science it, it's true and people don't change their minds they just die basically he's not the only one who says that but there's plenty of others too. Yeah, I totally, it's totally true. Uh, yeah. You see it everywhere. Have you, There's a cool series that uh, really looks at that. Um, it's called Altered Carbon on Netflix. Yeah, with Have the stacks. Yeah, I watched um, the whole first it? season was great. And then the second yeah, fell off. The first off. season is all you have to worry about. Yeah, uh, don't watch the second one. Not I, I, the I gave up season. on the second one because I really didn't care. <laughs> yeah, but the first season basically is all about uh, life extension. And basically in the, in the show, the ultra rich kind of end up the ultra rich forever. And it makes uh, wealth inequality, you know, much yeah. worse than it is now. Because remember... you're able, imagine if you have a stock, uh, you know, you're able to own Tesla stock for a thousand years. And it just, and uh, Elon Musk, you know, <laughs> he, he doesn't want to do this. But if someone like him were able to keep transferring their consciousness and just <laughs> have the most valuable company in the universe and just yeah. keeps being dominant forever. Yeah, he said it's not that great to be him. It's not as great as it looks to be him. And uh, in this pretty recent uh, interview, yeah, it looks he, like a lot of hard work to me. Yeah, yeah. and he, he he's like obsessed. He has to just keep going. That's where his Twitter breaks are nice, <laughs> Make, making funny jokes, trolling. Like he just said, AOC was trying to hit on him. He was joking around on. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> he likes it, and hopefully he'll make it better uh, now that he's buying it yeah you know, uh, he did it's say anyone if you use anything that you have right like you want to improve it you see like these things are annoying <coughs> well how are you going to do it the easiest way is if you own it the yep. thing with elon is he actually could buy it so <laughs> <laughs> he, he went ahead and bought it everyone's joking about him buying everything else oh what did he say he was gonna put the cocaine back into coca-cola after buying it <laughs> yeah that's, I mean, that's a famous meme uh yeah. and a funny fact about you know how prevalent drugs used to be 
uh, yeah. in, uh, you know, in history. But what I was going to say about that interview, he actually said that, that he thought about it after the guy asked him a question and he said, like, dying might actually feel a, as a, a relief mm-hmm. because of the, and so, yeah, that's what you, you know, you were saying he doesn't want to keep on going and going and going. I believe the same. I think death is as natural as birth and yeah, I've thought about it a good amount. That's a good big part of the reason why my channel is named this. Just because there's been a, it's beneficial. Alan Watts talks about it. He's a great philosopher, uh, and many others. There's a lot of the Eastern traditions. Like say, if you go to India, they literally have burning bodies uh, and open, exposed bodies of people, and they don't hide from death the same way that the West hides from death. And uh, you know, there might be an open casket here and there, but it's nowhere near the level of exposure that in the East compared to. You know, I, I once had a, uh, let's just say, uh, interesting experience and uh, the uh, the feeling and that I had was that I was going towards death Whoa. and that I was uh, very close to it. And all I had to do was just relax a little more and I would die. And it felt like a great relief. What triggered and, it? What caused it? Um. Like I said, it'll just say an interesting experience. I got gotcha. you. Um, Some people have spontaneous ones too. That's what I was say uh, asking. Like, there's a yeah. certain percentage of the pe- people in the uh, world. Like, I think it was like two percent. They have spontaneous psychedelic trips without having to have any drugs whatsoever. Like. And some people uh-huh. have out of body experiences, like I don't know where, like Art Bell, the former uh, Coast to Coast AM guy, he was awesome. The, the paranormal radio, he's probably the most iconic guy by by far in that genre. And he said he was in France, and I don't know where he was in bed. His his consciousness launched out of his body, and he was hovering over France, and he was terrified. And then he snapped, he snapped back inside of his body. And he was talking to a guest who is an expert on uh, leaving the body. It's called, uh, not near-death experiences, there's another word for it, a- astral projecting and stuff like that, like astral body, they call it, where you're hovering outside. Oh, I know there's OB, out-of-body experiences, OBEs, they call them. And so, yeah, maybe that's what you were having. Uh, no, there was an outside chemical that caused it. No, <laughs> but it, but it is all like um uh you know it comes down to brain chemistry so it's all uh natural if you ingest chemicals from outside it's possible that a lot of the same chemicals are already in your brain they're just in different concentrations so it's possible then to have that happen naturally if maybe some kind of you know natural process is not working quite right and then you have an imbalance and it can happen that way and that's you know some diseases uh that are called diseases because they interfere with your ability to uh to function and what (laughs) it would um yeah would uh you know kind of society or considers to be a normal way then uh um yeah you know, so. DMT is naturally created in the brain. They, a lot of people speculate it's the pineal gland that creates it, and they say that it happens near death. Like as you're nearing that transition period, uh, it starts the chemical starts to be releasing you. And a lot of people, when they're nearing death, they they say they're starting to see their family members on the other side, and they're starting to greet them and comfort them and bring them over. And it sounds like the same experience that a lot of these DMT people who tried it, they say that you're experiencing real entities who say, hey, I, I can't believe you finally figured out how to get over here. I'm happy you're able to visit us. Please visit us, visit us more. And these feel like uh, separate entities, but yet a lot of scientists say, you know, it's all a hallucination in the brain, but it's such a persistent mm-hmm. and convincing solution. I mean, uh, hallucination, not solution, that a, a lot of people think that it's, it's real. And yeah, I'm still convinced. I, I have a feeling it's not in the brain only. Like science says that, but <clears throat> the only reason why science doesn't doubt that love exists is because everybody is able to experience love. You see some physiological changes in the labs, you know, when somebody falls in love, some endorphins kick off and, and, you know, there's, there's changes that happen, but that's just the, the byproduct. But the experience of love is the primary thing and the changes in the body, I would say is the secondary thing. But science says. I don't really see how the, the two relate though. 
well, what do you think about the feeling of love, whether it's for, you know, a girlfriend, wife, whatever, or ver or family love? Like, uh, just to ask anyone who's been married for, you know, a, a <laughs> long time, they'll tell you the answer to that. <laughs> but I'm saying there's a relation between the, the chemical processes in the body and the sure. direct experience of love. And so I I think that the body's more like a receiver, like a antenna for the TV. That's what Graham Hancock and, and some scientists say that too, but they're considered to be more fringe. Like Rupert Sheldrake is one of them. And uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, like- Receiving what? Receiving? Yeah, like the, because uh, the brain obviously does when you get certain areas of it damaged, you know, certain aspects of your functioning, depending on what's damaged or your memory or whatever it is, depending on what part that's not going to function properly anymore. So it's possibly they related similar to how an, a TV antenna, if a certain part of it gets damaged, maybe certain frequencies might not come through and that it, it ties into, you know, what Huxley and the doors of perception book uh, and uh, Basically, a lot of people who study psychedelic drugs and looked at the findings in science, they come to the conclusion that you can merge the two and it's a more likely solution than just the, the straight scientific mainstream idea of today. Hmm. I think people who are, you know, want to contribute, attribute more meaning to everything that happens to them when there really is no good reason to, hmm. but they naturally want to attribute meaning to everything. Mm -hmm. True. And, you know, that's just the natural thing. We've been doing it for a long time and, you know, gets, uh, makes people feel better and how you feel is a lot of your experience. So, yeah. Uh, let me make sure we're hitting everything on this subject before well, I was we want hit... people who are making decisions for a lot of other people not to necessarily put all their uh, eggs in that basket and uh, yeah. make more rational, detached, logical choices. Yeah, maybe. they definitely don't have all their eggs in there because there's not enough proof for that theory. Even though the pieces tend to fit, that doesn't mean it's 100% fact. So uh, I was going to say, though, like with people who hang on to their ideas, the, there's a main guy who's in charge of Gobek, I mean, uh, the pyramids in Egypt. His name is Zawi Hawass, and he is so dogmatic and he, he just uh, he's wants... in charge of the pyramids in Egypt. Yeah, the caretaker put and... him uh, in charge Egypt. He's like, yeah, uh, yeah, guy, like... like tourism, keeping it uh, maintained and stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure if he himself is an archaeologist or whatever, but he's been in charge for many, many decades. And he do they do like restoration stuff on that? Or does it just kind of sit there? Well, on the inside, if you look on the videos, they made sure it's stable and they have like supporting stuff in their shafts, I believe I've seen. Hmm. And they reinforce yeah. it so it doesn't collapse. Yeah, like for safety reasons, I think they've done that. And they've they've done a few things over the years. Uh but yeah, cool it, to look at like a video tour of inside a pyramid. I did. I, that's where I'm. I'm getting that from memory from watching it. You can watch them on YouTube. Was that? Uh, was there? Is there a lot to see in there? Is it kind of yeah, they, interesting? Yeah, they added a lot of uh, lighting as well for people because you, otherwise yeah. it would be these pitch black staircases. But they got these sure. lightings that are projected on the walls, and that way it's not blinding you as you're going up the stairs. Yeah. But yeah. You um, see the hieroglyphics inside. Yeah, like it, statues, you know, I, stuff that they want to, uh, you know, for whoever it's honoring, right? Because they were tombs for. Well, no, the, the, the main powerful. Big, the big pyramids, they were never, they never found any bodies in them, and so there's a lot mm -hmm. of uh, alternative hypotheses for. Uh, oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, there, there's some really wild <laughs> ones. That aliens. But I was gonna say it's actually more barren in there, and uh, than you would think. There's like when you're going through the hallways and stuff, it's not loaded with hieroglyphics. Like there's a bunch of other places in Egypt that have like pre well preserved uh, hieroglyphics and stuff. I think I saw one. Was it the tomb? You're telling me they had thousands of slaves work for decades, and it's mostly for empty stuff, just to make big artificial mountains. It looked good from a distance. Well, they, you remember the, they used to have this white colored, uh, really bright white coloring on the outside of the pyramids, but that wore off too. 
and it was like really shiny and white like during the time of uh, alexander the great when they were there like that was oh man what was it like i don't know i'm gonna butcher the years but it was way before julius caesar's time and so it was in the bc what was it around 1000 bc or something like that it was a long time ago <laughs> and uh yeah they they have the accounts back then and it was totally different than what it is now and uh, makes sense i think Would be. there might have been golden tips at the top or something there was something that was removed off the tips mm, those yeah. are stolen <laughs> yeah <laughs> too valuable to be sitting there forever yeah. it, just oh, like so if uh if like our cities are ever abandoned and they all uh <laughs> yep. there's like skyscrapers sitting there there's some valuable you know materials on like the antennas on the tips of the <laughs> the, the buildings yep. they'll be stolen <laughs> i was going to say though about zawi hawass He's like really uh, invested into the idea that the Egyptian people built it, uh, the pyramids, and he like has a lot of Egyptian pride. And so he doesn't want to have any alternative hypothesis come up and uh, like Gobekli Tepe. Oh, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So Gobekli Tepe is the most important discovery of all time so far. And that's the, it predates because it was purposely buried it's like Stonehenge, but way, way older and way, way larger. I forget the exact years, but it makes a civilization back like, te uh, what was it, almost 10,000 years? Or it was, it was in the thousands of years uh, earlier than... Ex so anyways, Graham Hancock is all over this with the alternative uh, hypothesis with the pyramids and uh, the dating of the Sphinx is uh, a big part of it because there was weather erosion on the Sphinx that proves it's way older than the Egyptologists say, but they don't want to hear anything about it. Scientific people, geologists, I believe his name is Robert Schock. Uh, hopefully I'm not getting my names mixed up. But yeah, he, he just went there with an open mind and looked and it was clear rain erosion and rain hasn't happened at the level needed to cause that amount of erosion on the Sphinx for a long time before the mainstream e Egyptologists say it's possible. So mm -hmm. like... So anyways, Graham Hancock had this debate with Zawi Hawass and Zawi Hawass was like sweating all crazy, like patting himself in the forehead, getting all angry and flustered. And he never even heard of Gobekli Tepe. This is in Turkey. It's being excavated, excavated now. And it's by far the most important discovery we've ever had. <laughs> and he has no clue. He didn't even know what it was called. He didn't have any idea. And this has direct implications for the pyramids themselves and the dating and the aging. And yet he's clueless. So uh, how many other ex so-called experts are clueless around the world? So, A lot of them. Yeah. And everyone you hire to do something for you, most of them are clueless too. <laughs> yep. You hire an AC technician, they're probably going to do a crappy job. <laughs> you hire an accountant, they're probably going to do a crappy job. Yeah. You hire someone to fix the irrigation, they're probably going to do a crappy job. Yeah. That's Correct. why your best bet is to do it yourself. Or <laughs> just figure out as much as you can yourself. <laughs> or just hire them. Don't to hire just... professional, anyone, professional services for anything, everyone. Become your own surgeon, your own doctor, your own accountant, your own lawyer. Or you just got to hire them to intelligence for. <laughs> hire them to destroy your house mm -hmm. and then they have no choice but to fix it then. Because <laughs> they'll mess up the destruction process. <laughs> no, I'm being serious here. Come on. Come on, <laughs> man. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, uh, the I heard that uh, one of the reasons that Egypt collapsed, along with many other cities, is because of um, there was a major supply chain collapse. Hmm. And uh, the uh, these ancient civilizations, when they became more specialized, they would uh, rely on a certain area for important materials or food, or um, like in the Bronze Age, it was... Uh, all of the materials to make bronze came from one mine in one country oh, yeah. and uh, everyone they built up a supply chain that was based all around that and for some reason or another that um, broke down and uh, after that all these cities got like everything went to chaos and war broke out and because all these people were really specialized and then the goods and services they were used to getting weren't there. So everything broke down and then it was like a free for all and you had all these, these people starving Jeez. and not their jobs uh, weren't bringing in the income anymore Jeez. and violence and uh, this whole cities got leveled. And then uh, after that, uh, you, uh, history enters into a dark age where really not much happens. It's just a bunch of uh, 
you know, murdering and uh, not much uh, being figured out or learned. Yeah. And then yeah. things kind of sp- grow up, like specialize again and it gets a little better. And then you get another, you know, good period. And then, yeah. then it breaks down again and you get like the medieval ages. And yeah, exactly. Another dark goes ages. Up and down. This is very unusual what we've experienced in our lives where it's just this slow upward tra- trajectory. Like in hardcore history, which Grimes was a fan of too, and I'm a huge fan of. He actually talks about that in one episode, but that's not one of the episodes I've listened to a lot. Uh, before I forget, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, it took about a thousand years for them to get back to the same standard of living. Like yeah, the aqueducts, sucks, the aqueducts, they didn't know how to like do anything anymore. And they were living in the ruins of these amazing people who were able to accomplish so much. Humanity does not seem to do well after one of these major collapses. Like we don't bounce back really fast historically. Oh, yeah. So we do, we could do amazing things when we specialize, but uh, when that falls apart, it's bad times for quite a while. Oh. Uh, so hopefully we get better at that as time goes on, because uh, we might be. In I don't for know. The worst maybe one. we're due for it. We're <laughs> in the we're due for the worst one ever. Look how high we are right now, and what all oh, we're, we're one solar massive solar flare away from knocking out the electrical grid, and everybody's specialist. Nobody knows how to hunt and gather. Everybody's de- dependent on medicine and imagine what that would look like that would be messed up that would be pretty bad at it it depends on what goes but um well some things give me a little hope uh with uh for example we had our supply chain has been heavily tested because of this pandemic that hit us and now this war that's breaking out so you Mm. see more um of the world wanting to bring more things in house and have a more resilient supply chain that has um multiple um sources for things uh, which is a good yeah which is a good redundancy if uh if we're too over specialized it's just like the human body there are redundancies in all our systems so that if one thing fails there's still something else to keep you alive maybe it won't work as well but you won't instantly die yeah we got to do the same thing with the global supply chain and civilization so that or not if like one place erupts in war or one thing disappears we're not all suddenly you know back into the dark ages and mm-hmm. uh all killing each other and there's countries collapse i'm a fan so... of getting storable foods there's ones that you could get like big containers uh many months supply for not even that ex- much and uh they last like 60 years or something like they got real long lasting ones where it's there if you need it if not mm-hmm. you could eat it in 40 years if you need it <laughs> or whatever like uh, become preppers have like everyone have uh, some of these in their houses i mean that's not like full scale prepping like tim pool gets Life made fun of by some people yeah like i mean having a little food like we saw the shortages of toilet paper and food in the grocery store how much stores do you think and... it's practical to have because it takes up space I mean, these crates, uh, maybe for, per, for, we'll see that if you have a big family, you want like a take week of food, I would say at least want? two, I would say at least two months. I would like two months of food for everyone. That might be a lot. Well, yeah, it depends how big your family is. <laughs> yeah. And it how would, big you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get small pretty quick, I guess, if the supply chain is going on. But <laughs> oh, I was going to say about ancient Rome, though. Uh, I was just listening to another hardcore history that, uh, about, uh, the Colosseum. Oh man, they used to have the uh, top legionaries of Rome. Like they would have three hundred of them going against three hundred bears in the Colosseum for everybody. To, and and they, it turns out that sucks, dude. <laughs> for the legionaries, like they're distinguished in the army. Oh, they they got to fight bears. Yeah, they would be. They destroyed the bears often, but oh, okay. the, the number one thing that killed. If they were losing people to the bears left and right, that would suck. Yeah. I'd be like, I'm in the army. <clears throat> I've done good. We've killed all your enemies. I've been <laughs> out on the campaign for years. Now I come back and I got to fight in your fucking circus yeah, and fight yeah. bears, get mauled by a bear. I mean, I'm sure some of them died, but not all of them. But, <laughs> but yeah, the, they also the rate had... is important, right? The <laughs> Praetorian, you know the ones who dress in purple who guard the oh, yeah. royalty basically the praetorian, praetorian! exactly <laughs> they, they had yeah i gotta watch gladiator two. again Good ass they would put those guys in there as well versus hundreds of lions 
And so they'd be fighting yeah. lions and they were a lot of effort went into getting these animals before they were like domesticated and fed. They wanted to get them straight from the wild, get them in cages and oh, get them great. to the Coliseum fed because they <laughs> don't want to let them out into the arena and have the lions just looking at the humans for more food instead of attacking like wild animals. They wanted them yeah. to be fierce. Makes and, sense. And I found that they even did naval battles. Naval battles, yeah. Yeah, they would fill it with water. That's pretty cool. How yeah, the they hell? Did a lot I never... of work, yeah. I can't, I, they had aqueducts, crazy. dude. Yeah, I guess they were able to, they had a sophisticated system. They were able to funnel water in, fill the top levels, and have uh, boats in there. And uh, yeah, that's you know, wild. Imagine yeah, but, us having something like that now. Oh, man. We don't do anything that technical, even like if it was a mock battle, you know, not for real. Like, you know, what do we have that's like that? Yeah. I mean, we have Hollywood. We have like, it's all happens in a movie. They do yeah, do stuff think. like that. But uh, they're able to do stuff like that, and it kind of comes out to everyone. Well, speak, Instead of having one Coliseum, our Coliseum is our televisions, basically. I forgot I had Marcus Aurelius going right here. Speaking of Rome. He's a good-looking guy. <laughs> yeah, he's cool. Marcus Aurelius. Happiness. The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Yep, yep. But uh, in that hardcore history, they talk about during the lunch breaks at the Coliseum, they would have these criminals who needed to be executed. And so they would bring out the execution people. Seneca was disgusted by this. And uh, these people were just brought in and executed. And some people would be sitting around, but it was way less popular than the main Why events. during lunchtime? Because it was just like... A, just a, You know, like they have the side shows. Light, light entertainment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like, like a halftime show. Well, yeah. halftime show is a big deal. So this then, is like off-time entertainment. Yeah, exactly. So there, he says mm -hmm. in that there would be people who were able to scream out from the audience of like what they wanted the executioner to do to somebody, and these people would actually do it. So like, just imagine how sick some of these people were. They're like just yelling things like how to mutilate this guy, and then the guy's like, "Yeah, I'll do it for you, crowd. We'll keep the That's crowd interesting. happy." Yeah, because there's a long history of people enjoying seeing violence done on other people. You know, yeah. it's not unique to the Coliseum. Uh, it's a long part of our history. Yeah, there's a guy in, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you more from this it, uh, the episode. It's a long August. part of our history. Obviously, I'm getting tired of staying <laughs> some shit like that. <laughs> Pain, uh, so there's an episode of Hardcore History called Painfotainment. Even Lex Friedman brought it up in the mm. Grimes podcast. Right, yeah, yeah. And that's where I'm getting all this from. I just re-listened to like the first half. And he points out in France in about 1750, so this was about George Washington, who was already around 20-something years old, uh, they haven't done any of these like heinous uh, executions in a long time, but somebody tried to kill the French president and he got caught red handed. And then so the French uh, people, they put out like, bro yeah. uh, we get to do whatever we want to you now. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they put out brochures that it was going to happen. And then so people were vote trying... on how to kill. <laughs> they br they were treating they brought uh, bought tickets from like all way in advance and they came like a week or two in advance just to get there they they were saying how they were going to torture sold this out guy. tickets yeah seen. Exactly. was that a premium yeah they were the, the all the hotels were booked get. yeah they were yeah. going as close as they could to the Super event Bowl. and then yeah. there was accounts of what happened and remember that first story i told you with all the crazy people when they were having the red hot tongs and twisting and ripping off like the the flesh of the uh from the story i told you uh, uh when familiar. they took over when they took over the town and then they, uh, the walls collapsed when he said oh i'm the chosen one after the other guy got killed all right yeah 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 anyways so the people were out like treating it like a tailgating party before a football game where they're all yeah, cooking sure. laughing joking around then the yeah. main event came up and there was people laughing there, there was a wide variety of uh like responses and they were messing up this execution and they wanted it to be slow they were ripping his meat off then they were uh, getting molten lead molten uh, metals and mm. combining it all together and throwing it inside of his wounds that he rips off the, with the red hot tongs and throwing that in. and people are watching this and enjoying it and some people were even having sex to it for some reason they, that was on the account <laughs> like people are just Kinky. randomly mm. so this is 1750 humans are just so strange yeah. You know, yeah, that's still in us. But the nice thing is entertainment has evolved where we could satisfy those things without actually killing people. Yeah. So that's a positive evolution of uh, the entertainment industry and the entertainment technology where 
now we're able to have fictional scenarios where no one is hurt. You know, there are people on set to make sure even animals aren't harmed anymore. The yeah. People lose a lose their head if uh, an <laughs> animal is harmed in the filming of a movie. And the movie could show, you know, people being bisected and so, you know, Freddy Krueger ripping their <laughs> intestines out and strangling yeah. them with it. And, you Crazy. know, it's fun. We all get to enjoy it now. And it like scratches that itch and uh, no one get hurt, gets hurt. So it's a good thing. We should all, yeah. you know, we, we're always going to have that built into us. It's I think it's in our lizard brain that's deep in <laughs> us. And we're just able to do that in a safe way, a nonviolent way. That's great. And hopefully it moves yeah. that way uh, with uh, with war in the future, where uh, instead of actual battles where we have to kill people and destroy things and, you know, it costs sports. a lot of money. We yeah. could just have, um, yeah, like a, some type of game, some sports, uh, yeah. sports cool. whether it's physical or it's like if you're able to have like a, a real, like if virtual reality gets really good and you're able to have everyone have a battle in virtual reality with all your you know, technology that you have and you just have the battle decided by who wins in the virtual reality game and then everyone abides by it, you know, that yeah. would, it's like could be the next evolution of warfare. True. Um, you know, I was we only got three minutes left here. I was going to get to the yeah. Mongol subject. We, we should restart it real quick and then I'll jump into the Mongols. Or do you have anything left to say? We'll, we're going to continue right after, but we get the Zoom limitation. We got to restart it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I don't know. I was kind of thinking of like letting it go there. If you just want to talk about the Mongol thing and we'll, you know, wrap All it right. up. Yeah, sounds good. All right, here, let's just restart it. We've got three minutes left. So, yeah, let's get into three minutes. All right, speed All right. round. I'll hurry up. Well, I was going to talk about the Titan NFT as well. Give them a uh, shout out. You could do your own video for that. All right, whatever. I'll do it next time then. Anyways, the Mongol <laughs> multi level marketing. The reason, the reason why, no, I'm just, they're cool people. It was a little fun community. So anyways, the Mongols, the only reason why Japan still exists is because the Mongols had two gigantic naval disasters when they were about to conquer Japan. Uh, they call these, the two events called the Kamikaze winds happened. They were like large storms and just massive winds. This is so, back when the Mongol Empire was at its height. It's yeah. It was powerful. Yeah, right at its peak, pretty much right when it... This, what this were the what, Japanese like at that time? They were had they... samurais. They had only about 40,000 samurais. And the Mongols, the first attempt was in 1274. Then they had 500 and 900 ships and 30,000 to 40,000 Mongols that died and all drowned in these massive, just from winds alone, natural disasters. Uh, yeah, that will it, fuck you over. Okay. And then, so this, uh, the second attempt, I mean, the Mongols were so Bad huge. luck, Mongols. <laughs> well, they get made fun of for being such hor so horrible at like the naval stuff, but they were easily able to dominate any army in the world. Uh, yeah. So here's the second part. He, they uh, attempted the second time. It was way larger. 4,400 ships with 140,000 Mongols versus wow. the Japanese who only had 40,000 samurai. The Japanese would have been wiped off the map. The Japanese animation and the whole culture and everything is so cool today. That would have been gone. I'm right Unless now they were all like expert samurais were able to cut down 50 men each. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nah, they, they were so good with their bows. They, they were screwed. But yeah, I mean, these were two of the biggest naval disasters ever. And then Kublai, Kublai was the uh, Mongol leader at the time. Uh, well, I forget well, what happened with all those ships. They didn't get there either the second no, time. They got destroyed too. The kamikaze wins two different times. The storm saved the Japanese. Ah, so, so they got lucky that area was a really hard area to not sail always across. though. Uh, they, not always, but all right, we got less than a minute to go. So yeah, if you guys want to uh, please subscribe and check out his channel as well. And uh, what else? Got anything else to say? Uh love yourself and love others <laughs> all right guys yeah do that and uh yeah so sorry i've slowed down on making more visual videos but i've just been so dedicated on the comedy idea and i've been typing it up i got many many pages of this pilot episode done already it's going to be wild and i want to dedicate myself while the weather's good so all right yeah hit hit up some messages i'd like to always hear from you guys and hope you guys enjoy. Have a good night. Take it easy.